This morning, uh, we're in Nehemiah chapter uh, 9 and 10. Uh, Last week, we looked at uh, what was going on in chapter 8. It was after they were finished with the wall. The people had a great celebration. Uh, They went before the Lord and they said, Lord, what is what is next for us? And so they brought out the word of the Lord and uh, they preached and there was, uh, there was a great uh, celebration. They had an eight-day festival, really. It was the Feast of Tabernacles, which is in the law, the book of uh, Moses. And it had not been celebrated like they did it for a thousand years. And so it was really a great time. Uh, when you think about that, what they were celebrating, well, it was somewhat similar to Thanksgiving which is coming up in a couple weeks. Uh, How many of you are hosting Thanksgiving to some extent? Okay, a few. Uh, That's good. Good for you. Um, Can you imagine doing that for eight days straight? That is what they did. They celebrated it was like a Thanksgiving feast. Thank you, Lord, for all that you've done for us for eight days long. And then they finish that, and then they get together again two days later. And that's what we're going to be looking at here in chapters 9 and 10. This particular observance, the ceremony, this day, is not something that is prescribed in the law that they're supposed to do every year. Apparently, this was just a one-time thing. They were so thankful that God had helped them so much that they, they did this here. And it is pretty long. Uh, both chapters 9 and 10 have over 30 verses in them. So I'm not going to read that whole thing. Um, in in the text here, it says that they preached for three hours and then worshiped and confessed for three hours. Uh, we would be here for six hours if I were to read this whole thing. Uh, but anyway, let's read this together. Nehemiah chapter 9, or I'll read this. On the 24th day of the same month, which is two days after the Feast of Tabernacles ended, the Israelites gathered together again, feasting and wearing sackcloth and putting dust on their heads. Those of Israelite descent had separated themselves from all foreigners. They stood in their places and confessed their sins and the sins of their ancestors. Go down, and I'm just going to read. I'm not actually going to tell you where I am here because it's so long. Um, You are the Lord God, they said, who chose Abram and brought him out of Ur of the Chaldeans and named him Abraham. You found his heart faithful to you. You made a covenant with him. You've kept your promise because you, Lord, are righteous. You saw the suffering of our ancestors in Egypt. You heard their cry at the Red Sea. You came down on Mount Sinai. You spoke to them from heaven. You gave them decrees and commands that are good. But they, our ancestors, became arrogant and stiff-necked, and they did not obey your commands. But because of your great compassion, you did not abandon them in the wilderness. You made their children as numerous as the stars in the sky, and you brought them into the land that you told your, their parents about to enter and possess. But they were disobedient and rebelled against you. So you delivered them into the hands of their enemies who oppressed them. But when they were oppressed, they cried out to you. From heaven you heard them, and in your great compassion you gave them deliverers who rescued them from the hand of their enemies." Now, therefore, our God, the great God, mighty and awesome, who keeps his covenant of love, do not let all this hardship seem trifling in your eyes, the hardship that has come upon us today. In all that has happened to us, you have remained righteous. You have acted faithfully while we acted wickedly. We are slaves today because of our sins. They, the foreign kings, rule over our bodies and our cattle as they please. We are in great distress. In view of all this, we make a binding commitment, putting it in writing, and our leaders and our Levites and our priests are fixing their seals to it. And those who sealed it were Nehemiah the governor and many others. The rest of the people, priests, Levites, gatekeepers, musicians, temple servants, and all who had separated themselves from the neighboring neighboring peoples for the sake of the law of God, together with their wives and all their sons and their daughters who were able to understand, all these now join their fellow Israelites, the nobles, and bind themselves with a curse and an oath to follow the law of God. And these were some of the things that they promised. 
We promise not to give our daughters in marriage to the peoples around us or to take their daughters for our sons. When the neighboring peoples bring merchandise or grain to sell on the Sabbath, we will not buy from them on the Sabbath or on any holy day. We will not, ne- <clears throat> we will not neglect the house of our God. There's actually four things that they commit to relating to the house of God, the temple worship, but it's all summed up right at the end of chapter 10. We will not neglect the house of our God. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for these words, and uh, these words this morning are, are many, and there are so many things in here that, that we could look at, and we, we pray that most of all, that we would see you working in the history of these people, that we would see you working with them as they were on that day, but Lord, also that you, we would see you working with us here today in our own lives, in our own pasts, in our own present, in our own future. So, Lord, guide us, help us to listen to you today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The first thing that we notice here is once again, the people are gathered together. How many times have I said that through the book of Nehemiah? Many. Because over and over again, when the people are faced with a crisis, they gather together. They are not making a commitment to God, confessing their sin, repenting of their sin, receiving God's mercy. They're not doing this alone. They're not even doing it family by family in their house. But they gather together. There's something about the gathering together that is very, very important for them. But they get together to get strength from the Lord and strength really from each other as well. And as we go along here, and this is a long section, the people praise and confess. In fact, you may or may not know this, this is a little bit of trivia. Where is the longest prayer in the Bible? Right here. Nehemiah 9 and 10. The people praise and they confess. If you go through here, you would see that they're going over a history of what God has done for them in the past. And there are at least 35 things that I'm most not going to mention most of them in order to, to, because of time constraints here. But they do God, they say that God does so many things for them. Starting out that you made the heavens and the earth and everything in them. You made the seas and everything that is in that. You give life to everything, and all heaven worships you. You chose Abram. You gave him a new name. You gave him a new identity. You heard the cry of the people at the Red Sea, and you did something about it, they say. They say, Lord, you led the people in the past with pillars of cloud by day and pillars of fire by night. You gave the people bread and water when they were hungry and thirsty, and you did not desert them ever in the wilderness. You did not put an end to the people when they were disobedient to you. You, Lord, were merciful. They describe God's character. They say, God, you are eternal. You alone are the Lord. This is what these people are saying together to God. You alone are the Lord. And in fact, just that one right there, I would like for us all together to say, you alone are the Lord. You alone are the Lord. Say that with conviction. You alone are the Lord. Again, you alone are the Lord. That's what these people are doing. They're shouting God's praises together. You are righteous. Let's say that. You are righteous. You are forgiving. You're forgiving. You're gracious. You're gracious. Lord, you are compassionate. Lord, you are compassionate. Lord, you are, you can, we'll stop now. Uh, Lord, you're slow to anger, abounding in love. Your goodness is great beyond our understanding. These people are focusing on God. They have done a great task together with God's strength, and now they're truly focused on God. And what they're doing is they're confessing the sin of their ancestors in part. And I'll just mention one or two because in the wilderness, they talk about 
the people became arrogant and stiff-necked. They refused to listen, and they failed to remember the miracles that God had done for them. In the promised land, when God had brought them through the 40-year wilderness journey and across the Jordan River and into the promised land where they were supposed to be, again, they were disobedient. They rebelled. They turned their backs on God and turned their backs on the law and on one another. They refused to listen to God. And what was God's response over and over and over? It was always grace, always help. God did not abandon them. What was kind of amazing is, and this is the history of Israel in just about 30 verses here, how many times God did something great for the people, and then within a couple weeks or maybe a couple days or maybe a couple years, they forgot about that. And they just decided that they wanted something different than what God had to offer them. The things of the world were a little bit more tempting and a little bit more exciting than following God, even though God had done great, great things for them. And I think that's a point I want to stick on here a little bit. God has done great things in your life. If you are, especially if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, he has saved you, he bought you, he gave you new life. What a wonderful God. What a wonderful Jesus. What a wonderful Savior that we have. And do you remember that every day? Do you follow that every day? Do you live in that every day? Or does the voice, the calling of the world, come in a little bit and get a little bit louder and distract you and and take you away? That happens to all of us, obviously. We're new creatures, but still living, dealing with, with sin. So that happens. But God is merciful over and over again. I want to show you something. In all the the verses that that are going on here, that are reading, I I printed this out and then I went through, and I'll I'll show it to you here. The orange and the pink are, well, I highlighted what was going on in the prayer. Let me get a little bit higher here. The orange and the pink are all the great things that God has done. All the times that he forgave the people, all the times that he was gracious, compassionate. The blue is the sin that the people did. Now, just what do you notice about those two lists? Yeah, God is stronger. God's grace is stronger than the sin. And even though the people sinned many, many times, we see grace here. It ends up grace. It ends up here forgiveness. In your life, you may sin many, many times. Maybe, right? That's an understatement. But God's grace is always bigger. God's grace is always greater than your sin. Absolutely. Well, they've said these things about their ancestors, and they confess that the same sin is going on inside of them. That the sins that those in the past committed were also committed by them in this day. Their disobedience, their pride, their arrogance, their forgetfulness is ours, is what they say to the Lord. And and theologically, We all share in the original sin because of our common humanity. Sin is passed down from one generation to the next, just as a force that lives inside of us. But practically, they inherited some character flaws from their fathers and mothers and grandparents and all that. I want to ask you, is that true in your life? And I realize that some of you are here today with your parents or your children are downstairs somewhere. But I want you to think for a moment. When things are passed down, you know, it's the blue eyes, it's the brown hair, it's the height, the body frame, whatever. There are a lot of things that are passed down. But are there character issues in you? I hope there are strengths that your parents had that are passed down to you. But when you look at yourself honestly, 
are there things that are weaknesses, and, and I'm, I shouldn't be looking at you guys. Um, are there weaknesses that have been in your parents that have now shown up in you? Or, looking the other way, when you look at your children's lives, do you see yourself, your flaws reflected in them? Because these things do get passed down. And sometimes the things that irritate you most about your kids, why is that? (laughs) They're just like you are. In some ways, that's God's revenge on your behavior when you were a kid. (laughs) But these people recognize, you know, those were the sins of our forefathers, and now they're right there in us right now. So what do they do? They go to the Lord. They cry out to the Lord that they're living with the results of their sin. They're not a free people. They have some freedom, limited freedom in Jerusalem and Israel here, but they're still living under the domination of a foreign king who can really do whatever he wants with them uh, economically, politically, you know, however he wants to. He can take as much taxes as he wants. Well, they cry out to God for help, Because they know, if I can find these pages again, they know if they cry out, there's grace here. God will rescue and deliver. So the people make a promise. They make a big promise to God and to one another. And these promises they make, they're binding, they're written, and they're public. This word binding, if you look at the Hebrew that's behind here, it's, it's very close. It it's, comes out of the same word as the Hebrew word amen. Do you know what amen means, right? It means yes. It means ye- this is a serious prayer. This is a serious praise. This is a, this is a serious commitment. Amen to this. It's written out so that when maybe a month from now or two months or two years from now, they're going to be looking at this thing. When their behavior starts to stray away from this, it is right there in front of them, and it's public. They're accountable one to another, and one person might be going off a little bit, and everybody else can say, hey, oh, there is somebody. Um, Hey, um, I'm trying to get, hey, Tim, you're going off a little bit come back. You made this public commitment. Come back to this. Or it might even, your own behavior might be regulated because you know, I made this public commitment. I don't want to be embarrassed about myself and my behavior. So they keep together. It holds them together. The signers here are named, separated, and they understand. Now, there are 84 people who are in this list, and Nehemiah puts himself right at the top of the list. He says, I am going to sign this. He was the John Hancock, I guess, of this, that he was committed to this. They're separated. They've separated themselves from the neighboring peoples for the sake of the law of God, that they have said they're not going to follow the ways, the priorities, the values of other kingdoms. They're going to follow the values and the kingdoms and the priorities of the kingdom of God as God was building that right there. And then the signers understood. Not everyone in Israel signed this. Uh, It says only those who were old enough, only those who understood. And so the very young would not have signed this. And and maybe those who were mentally not able to, to really understand and agree to this. But it wasn't something that they were taking lightly. This was a serious commitment before the Lord. This was a solemn promise that they were going to do this. And you might notice, if if you read this later, get more in-depth in this, the promises cover their whole lives. Specifically, there are three areas. Family was first. They're going to stop marrying their daughters. And you guys have daughters, and you have daughters, and there's daughters here, and there's a lot of daughters represented here. They're going to stop marrying their daughters to just anyone. 
And uh, one of the things that was going on culturally, historically there was if you had a daughter, you could align yourself with another family politically or economically. Uh, you would tie yourself to the future of that family. So if you had a daughter who was well-trained, if she was uh, attractive, you could basically sell her off for and get a really good deal out of her. And it was, what was happening was some of the daughters, many of the daughters, were ending up in Gentile families. And so the worship of God was not being passed, the one true God was not being passed on from generation to generation. It was getting confused. It was getting mixed. Now, in the New Testament, we have uh, similar ideas. Paul says that uh, people should not be unequally yoked where Christians should not marry non-Christians. That is a much better, wise thing to do. And so, uh, for those who are considering selling off your daughters, I don't know, you might be able to get a good price for yours. <laughs> yeah, retire early, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Buy one, get one. For those who have uh, daughters of, of marital age, you might give them wisdom about who they should choose for a spouse. But, but really, what this was about was not tying yourself in with the world's priorities. The second thing is a similar principle, but a different application because it was related to the business. Uh, they promised they would obey the weekly Sabbath laws and even that they would practice the Sabbath year, which was once every seven years, you did not plant, you did not harvest, you just trusted in God that he would provide for you through six out of seven years. In the New Testament, Jesus said to his followers, if you put the kingdom of God first in everything, then you will have whatever it is that you need. The choice for these people was, were they going to try to make more and more and more money and depend on their own sense of productivity and hard work ethic and, and all that, or would they trust in God? And these people chose in their economic business life, they would trust God. And then the place of worship. And these four things uh, all relate to tithing and other temple taxes, bringing the, the firstborn, the first fruits into the temple, uh, for, uh, for either for sacrifice or for donations, really. Uh, essentially, this was putting the temple first again. They were making sure that, that the worship of God was going to be first in their life, first in their family economies, first in just every way. What's going on here is that they commit to living within the freedom of being limited, now, I have to explain that. But there is freedom to living within God's limits. Now, they might make less money, be more limited in choice of family alliances, uh, spend more money on the temple worship system. But these are things that God wanted them to do so that they could become the people that God wanted them to be. True freedom comes from being exactly who God created you to be. Freedom does not come from trying to be someone else, trying to be someone that the world wants you to be. Let me put it this way. If God created you to be an eagle, then why are you hanging around with the turkeys? Especially three weeks before Thanksgiving. God has created you to be wonderful, his child, something magnificent. You are the highest part of creation. Why would you allow yourself to lower yourself to live by the standards of this world? You will only truly be free if you live the life that God wants you to, be, to live in every single way. These people realize that. To live in God's limits would be freedom for them. 
And they do commit to making worship a high priority. They've gotten away from that. And now they're going to maintain the temple worship and give it the importance it deserves. For you, how important is worship to you? I want to address an issue before it becomes an issue. I know it's great to get coffee and donuts or something to eat before the service. It is great to have fellowship with one another, somebody you haven't seen for a week or a couple of weeks, and maybe family or friends, good friends. That is wonderful. That is part of why we're here, to be a body of Christ and to have a, a, a Christian social experience here. But when you come into this room, are you coming into this room with a quiet heart that is seeking to listen to God and to focus on God? And maybe more than just a quiet heart, but a quietness of spirit, a quiet mouth, I would even say, so that you can focus on God? When you come in here, are you having a quietness about you so that others can find a moment, even before the worship starts, to, to experience some peace, some, some rest before worship? Okay, that's as hard as I'm going to get on that. But it's just something to think about. But even, even now, in the worship that we're in right now, the part of worship, do you expect that God is going to speak to you in, through his word, through the music, through something? Are you hoping that God is going to meet you right here? Do you confess your sin during this time and remember God's mercy towards you? Remember the blue and the orange. There's a lot more orange than blue. But then also, not just public worship and personal worship, do you spend time alone in study and in prayer? Uh, different ways, there's many different ways to pray, many different ways to study. Uh, re just reading the Bible devotionally, do you have devotional helps? Do you read books? Do you have things that are helping you along your personal path? And I, I'm not trying to make anyone feel guilty. Nope, not doing that. Not going there. I'm not trying to say that following Jesus is a matter of doing certain religious activities. If you do so many from this box and this column, whatever, then you're a better Christian. I'm not. What I'm saying is, is your heart open to God? So this openness to God brings you to a place of rest and obedience even in your life. Another thing going on here, they will teach their children better. They know their, a lot of their sin and sinful habits have come down from their parents, grandparents, whomever. And they're kind of acting like that right now in this moment. And they're being disciplined for it in this moment here. But when they make this promise before God that I'm going to do better, what they're doing is they're telling their children you know what? This is how we are going to live. This is the kind of people that we are going to be. And they can't make their children do this. But when the children who don't understand grow up, what they're seeing are good examples, good models of behavior. And they are being a light, even within their own home, to their children. Now, many of you do have children. And you know how important that is. And children aren't always going to listen. Not always. Once in a while they're not. Right? But it's important for you to maintain an example, to maintain uh, an attitude of, of obedience and uh, humility before the Lord. To stick with your commitments to the Lord. To show them how important that is. And to teach them. Raise them up in the instruction of the Lord. So, the final thing as we move, we move into communion. As we do this, I would like for you to do something like the people back here in th that day were doing. Confess your sin, but remember how merciful God is. 
and make some kind of a commitment to God. You don't have to tell me what it is. You don't have to go out and say, I promise that this, this, and this. That's a, this is something between you and the Lord. And it doesn't have to be the greatest, biggest thing that anybody's ever done. But in your life, what is a commitment that you need to make? Some habit, some thing you need to change before the Lord. I would encourage you to, to think about that as we go through communion. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for these words of Nehemiah, this great commitment that they had to one another and to you. Lord, we ask that as we receive this bread and cup today, that you would remind us again of your mercy towards us that is so much greater than our sin. But Lord, help us also to know uh, some of the things that, that we need to change and we need to make a commitment about. Uh, Lord, we, we ask that you would help us in this time we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.